Hi there, it's Samantha McGalrick, and you are in the right place if you are a director or executive leading safe and healthy work in the boardroom or C-suite. I'm quite excited about today's topic because I'm often talking to my clients about the importance of getting out into the workplace and engaging in conversations with the workers, supervisors, and line management about workplace health and safety. There is no question in my mind that executives need to conduct site inspections particularly at sites they nominally control. When a site visit is done in the context of health and safety, this is commonly referred to as a safety walk. I know you've heard this before, but speaking with those at the coalface gives you real insight into finding out what's working and not working in your business. But it's also going to help you in your leadership role to manage hazards and risks. Safety walks are also an invaluable opportunity to demonstrate your leadership, but there are a few things you need to think about to get the most out of each and every visit. Think about this. When you're in the workplace, you are in the employee's or supervisor's domain. This is generally where they are most comfortable. When people are comfortable, they are their most authentic and transparent. This means you are likely to see Work as it is done, not as it is imagined through those well-written policies and procedures, or not as it is reported through performance reports, which are not identifying any issues or areas of concern. You have this great opportunity during a safety walk to make direct observations there and then on specific areas of concern or interest. But this opportunity can create some hesitation from leaders who are not necessarily confident in how to have a productive and exploratory health and safety conversation and who therefore may need some guidance in implementing a safety walk. It's funny, when I started as a safety professional, much of my work was around conducting audits, which is a great way to understand systems, people and culture. And I understood very quickly that the auditor is not well liked although that is debatable because it really depends on the audience. Those engaging the auditor love the auditor. Those being audited, not so much. But the key to conducting audits was just getting people to open up. So you're asking open questions, you're getting them comfortable, and you're asking about them. Tell me more about that. How do you do that? What are the risks involved in that? You know more about the work than I do, you tell me. So today's message is for those of you who are either not conducting safety walks, or if you are, you may be wanting a bit more guidance on your approach, or you wanna confirm that your approach is supported by some evidence-based research into health and safety culture and leadership so that your efforts are best placed. Or maybe you just wanna benchmark your approach with what is happening or what is being advised to others in similar roles. Let me be clear. This message is for organizations of any size. In fact, the example I'm going to go through today is about the BP oil blowout in the Gulf of Mexico. Size doesn't matter when it comes to safety walks. The biggest and brightest and what one would consider the safest companies can experience tragedies and in fact they have. This advice is not tailored to directors, it's more general advice for executives but the principles can be applied because directors should absolutely also be conducting site, uh, safety walks. So with all of that in mind, let's get started. I'm gonna break down the safety walk into three stages, before, after, or before, during, and after. Within each stage, I'm going to provide activities or behaviors for you to consider that are underpinned with the motivations, attitudes, perceptions, and skills that are necessary to make the safety walk a valuable and meaningful experience for you and for those you're visiting and chatting with. So before you visit the site, one of the first things to consider is whether your safety walk will be scheduled or unscheduled. Now it's often too difficult to keep an executive visit secret, but more importantly, I want you to think about your motivation for doing the safety walk. For example, what are you hoping to achieve by conducting an unscheduled visit? If it's to catch people off guard, then you're missing the point of the visit. You are having a conversation, not completing a checklist. This is not a tick in the box exercise. I have gotten tremendous value from conducting site inspections, even though my visits were generally scheduled. It's all about the conversation, but you need to be prepared 
so that you are informed and have a, to have that valuable and meaningful conversation. You need to think through the people you really want to meet with and whether or not they're going to be available. That sounds simple, but I had to speak with a technician once who conducted remote work on aerial stations out in the middle of nowhere. I needed to speak with those technicians, but that wouldn't have been possible if I hadn't scheduled the visit because the technicians were rarely ever in the office. The second consideration before conducting your safety walk is to prepare. And by this, I mean, get across the hazards, risks, and controls at that site. Understand the variables that impact on health and safety. What are the critical safety roles? If you prepare, you are much more informed and that is going to help you in your conversations with those on site. Remember, your visit isn't about housekeeping. You're not really interested in that. You are there to watch how work is being done, particularly thinking about the hazards and critical risks at the site. And then you're just speaking with people, perhaps those in critical safety roles, and I don't mean safety officers or health and safety reps. I'm referring to people who have responsibility for the controls in place for those critical risks. And if you wanna to speak to those people, you may need to organize for them to be available. So scheduling your visit may be imperative. In determining where to go, I suggest you take a holistic approach. Visit those sites with a higher risk profile, perhaps more often, and schedule it in. Amend your schedule based on your monitoring activities, monitoring your health and safety performance. For example, your KPIs have told you that a particular site has completed only 40% of their scheduled maintenance. Why not visit that site to get an understanding of what's happening Use this KPI to inform your discussions. You're not necessarily going to bring up that 60% of the maintenance has been delayed, but you informally ask about how maintenance is done, scheduled, resourced, and are there times when it doesn't get done or can't get done? As a matter of fact, poorly maintained equipment is implicated as a contributing factor in hundreds of workplace fatalities and serious injuries each year. And it could be argued that inadequate maintenance constitutes a failure to exercise due diligence in ensuring health and safety. For example, maybe maintenance is scheduled during work hours, which impacts production, which you could determine for yourself as to whether that may be a factor in the delaying of maintenance. So now we're at the site. What are the types of activities and behaviors that you want to undertake and exhibit when you're there? Above all, my biggest recommendation for you is to listen more than you talk. Don't spout safety as a priority. They've heard it all before. When you're on site and you have engaging and meaningful conversations with the workforce, supervisors, line managers, you are actively communicating that safety is a priority. You can get comfort at this point that you are walking the talk and this is truly leadership behavior. I said it earlier, but I'll say it again. Don't use this as an opportunity to complete a checklist. This is not an inspection, it's a conversation with some informal audit activities to give yourself some comfort, but you want to listen and empathize with the people you're speaking with. Ask open questions and have a chronic sense of unease or a creative mistrust of good news. I want to paint a picture for you as an example. This is from a working paper written by Andrew Hopkins and published by the National Research Center for Occupational Health and Safety Regulation on the seven hours before the Gulf of Mexico oil well blowout of 2010, better known as the Macondo Deepwater Horizon blowout. The premise of the paper was to assist VIPs in making productive use of, the visit, of their site visits. Hopkins says safety is often a focus for visiting VIPs, but too often safety is misunderstood to be a matter of slips, trips, and falls rather than the major hazards that can blow the plant or the rig apart. The paper also looks at things that senior management can do to focus attention on the most significant hazards. So there were several indications in the hours before the blowout that the well was not under control. In fact, it was flowing. That is, the oil and gas were forcing their way upwards from several, several kilometers below the sea floor. These indicators were all either mis- or misinterpreted by the rig staff. The touring VIPs, two from BP and two from the rig owner Transocean, 
had all worked at drilling uh, as drilling engineers or rig managers in the past and had a detailed knowledge of drilling operations. Had they focused their attention on what was happening with the well, they would have almost certainly recognized the warning signs for what they were and called a halt to operations. But their attention was focused elsewhere and an opportunity to avert the disaster was lost. The tragic irony here is that the major purpose of the visit was to emphasize the importance of safety. And yet the VIPs paid almost no attention to the safety critical activities that were occurring during their visit. For example, Soon after their arrival, the VIPs visited the drilling shack. This is the center of drilling operations. They found the rig personnel engaged in discussion about just how to do the test and the meaning of the results. The BP men and residents on the rig told one of the VIPs, we're having a bit of trouble getting lined up for the test, but it's no big deal. The VIPs asked no more questions about this and then moved on to a social conversation about the history of the company. Presumably, because the RIC was owned by Transocean, the senior Transocean executive in the VIP party assumed the de facto role of tour host. He noted that the tone of the conversation he heard among the drillers was confused. As a result, he suggested that the on-site rig manager who was accompanying the VPs, VIPs on their tour should stay behind to help and that the VIP should move on so as not to distract the people engaged in the reduced pressure test. Later in the day, he asked the on-site rig manager if the test had gone well and was given the thumbs up. His question clearly invited the response he got. This was a closed question. It invited a yes or no response, which does not infer a serious injury. He did not probe for evidence and simply accepted the reassurance he was given. So just going back to my original point, ask open questions and have a creative mistrust of good news. Carrying on from the BP example, my next recommendation is about your listening skills. Pay attention to the body language and tone of voice. Listen to what is being emphasized because this will tell you what is really important to the person you're speaking with or what really bugs them or concerns them. Remember the Transocean VIP could hear that the tone of the conversation amongst the drillers was confused and at that time he acted on that. Finally, get people talking about issues that spring up on a daily basis. Issues that may change the way work is done or issues that increase the risk of something happening or issues that make it more difficult to implement the procedural controls. What I want you to walk away with is a better understanding of the way work is done the attitude toward risk and the behaviors that exist and people's challenges and pain points. You'll get all of this from observation and conversations. When I was meeting with the technician I mentioned earlier, it was invaluable to have an understanding of the hazards, risks and controls with their work before I got to site because I could ask more targeted questions. Part of my questioning and learning was to understand how work can change on a day-to-day -day basis and what sort of decisions need to be made when work conditions change. For example, the technician had mentioned that the weather is one of the biggest hazards in their work. Quite rightly, if it rains or it looks to rain or if the wind was too extreme, they would need to cancel the work. But you can ask so many questions from this one risk and control. When do you make up the work? Will this increase productivity pressure because you have KPIs around uptime in your service level agreements? No? What is considered extreme weather conditions? How do you define this? If you're speaking with multiple people, you want to keep your ears open to hit consistency in that answer around what is considered extreme. Another control with this client at the time when working remotely was that the work was conducted in pairs. So think about what you can ask from that. What happens if that person is sick? Do you meet that person before you arrive at site or out on site? Because what if that person is injured or fell ill on the way there? Would you be called back? Have you ever been called back? Do your phones work out there? Are you provided with a phone? If you use a satellite phone, are they reliable? So in this example, I've moved into a subset to understand the critical risks and controls which is you also need to think about the complexity of different hazards that can impact health and safety outcomes at the site. And these may not be identified as critical risks. 
Hazards often result from multi-causal factors, and many originate inside and outside the business. This may include technical, human, and organizational factors, each of which may be an essential or contributing factor to an incident. Recognizing hazards requires you to think holistically and put your attention to all three of those sources, technical, human, and organizational factors, and the interdependence that exists between them. You may think about contractors and how that impacts on the work at the site or where the site is conducting work with other duty holders. You may think about performance incentives and how they impact on how work is done. These are all business factors that impact on health and safety outcomes. And the workforce are likely to be aware of these. But if not, you will find out through your conversations. And then there are hazards that will not necessarily translate to an immediate injury or illness. Instead, many hazards can lay dormant or latent. They have a potential risk of harm, but an incident only occurs when active and latent hazards align. It's like the planets have aligned and it's not in a good way. In a simple example, you may have a broken pavement, wet floor, or an untidy work area. These are all examples of latent hazards that may lead to a trip, slip, or fall injury. But the risk these hazards pose is significantly increased by the presence of additional hazards that attract attention away from or obscure view of the floor ahead. For example, rushing or loud noises that distract you thinking, texting, or carrying bulky items. Don't underestimate the complexity of this concept. It is a skill in terms of understanding how workplace health and safety and broader business factors are inextricably intertwined. But if you truly understand this concept, interrogate system vulnerabilities, and take a holistic approach to identifying hazards, you will be a much better leader at leading safe and healthy work and thinking strategically about health and safety. So now you've left the site. Your brain is probably on overdrive from all the information you just took in, from things you want to follow up on or things that concerned you. At this point, just take some time to think. If there were things that concerned you, think about the system or those latent hazards or business factors that is causing people to think or act that way. What is their motivation? There may be some cultural influences at play. Remember, people don't just do unsafe things. And if they do, don't get me wrong, there's some underlying issues there and that need to be further explored. But generally, you're not going to blame the person you want to understand the why. After you've done some considered thinking, how can you act now act on what you know? Paul O'Neill, ex-CEO of Alcoa in the US and a great case study for safety leadership, has said leaders need to remove the obstacles. Talk to your management team and work out what needs to change to make an impact on the challenges faced in the workplace you visited. The one thing I can say to you with absolute certainty is that what you do or don't do post a safety walk to address the challenges in that workplace that you were advised of will make or break the impact you made from that safety walk. It could be a small change or it could be significant, but remove the obstacles, close the loop, and you will see a change that ripples through the organization in terms of business excellence, just like Alcoa did. O'Neill increased the company's annual net income by five times and its market capitalization by $27 billion and was one of the best performing stocks on the Dow Jones Index, all while becoming one of the safest companies in the world. Another thing to consider is that a culture of safety is a learning culture, as defined by James Reason. In this context, it means there is the will from management to implement major reforms when the need is indicated. You need to trust with validation that those who were brave enough to tell you what wasn't working did so with the intent to make the business better, safer, and healthier. Listen to your gut here. On that note, think about rewarding people who bring difficult issues to the forefront. This is also a sign of Reason's culture of safety. That is, a culture of safety is a just culture, where one does not attribute blame to the bearer of bad news. Rather, a culture of safety values reporting and welcomes bad news, and respectively challenges good news. So that's a wrap. I hope this information gives you the confidence you need to conduct a safety walk, or just some insights to improve what you're doing currently, 
or just helps you learn from others' mistakes. When you're finished watching, I'd like to know, what is the most important activity you do as part of your safety walk, before, during, and after? Leave a comment below and let me know. And if you like this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with others. If you want to get a regular dose of what to ask and when to act, hit that subscribe button below. If you're interested in diving further into content like this, head over to my blog on smsafetysolutions.com.au. While you're there, be sure to sign up for my newsletter to get notified of more good stuff on health and safety governance and leadership, and promotions and other insights, tips and strategies, or free resources that I only share via email. As always, I hope I have contributed further to you knowing what to ask and when to act. Thanks for watching. Until next time.